positively impact technology over the next three to five years. So what we're going to talk about today is the technology that we're seeing out in the school district, what we're seeing in the university, what we're seeing in the research, what we're seeing in, in venture capital funding of what what's going on to support these teachers. And I always I always uh, use Wayne Gretzky's uh, quote to skate where the puck is is going to be, not where it has been. And that's really important as we do technology planning to say, uh, let's not plan with the current technology. Let's plan for, with emerging technology. So. Um, speaking of plans, we, we do a lot of technology plans and we think it's important that you have a framework for the role of technology and a roadmap for what is the role of technology in K-12? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times as we get as we start doing technology planning, we have some great ideas for the technology and almost 100 percent of the time it comes back to we don't have a reliable network and systems infrastructure. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that today, but just bear in mind that you have to have a reliable networks and you have to have things be readily fixed if they break. And if you don't, your best laid plans will fail. Also, um, a, a huge growth area for us is cybersecurity. And we'll talk about that because schools are getting hit with lots of cybersecurity malware, ransomware, and unfortunately we spend a lot of time dealing with those things. And it's also there, as you'll see tonight, there's a lot of um, pretty good funding for technology that we'll talk about, and we'll talk about evaluation and feedback mechanisms. So the framework that we use for technology planning is the role of technology is to connect the learner, evaluate performance, promote literacy, and level the playing field. And and this is a this is an entire another semester class, but but it, it this boils down the research on what is the role of technology in K-12. So notice it is not to replace the teacher. The picture that you have is is Skinner's teaching machine from 1954. So since 1954, people have been trying to replace the teacher, haven't been able to do it, and will not be able to do it because teaching is such a human human endeavor. Uh, you'll hear me talk about the different parts of the hype cycle. I want to spend a minute on this. This is this is from the Gartner Group at Gartner.com. But you've all I think you've all been there with the technology. Imagine a new technology that you've heard about, and that's the technology trigger. This graph is if you go from left to right is is over time, and from bottom to top is the visibility. So almost all technology goes through this, and all the emerging technology that we're we will talk about tonight goes will go through this is going through this and it starts with the peak of inflated expectations and and then it goes into the trough of disillusionment then the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity so when we plan for k-12s or universities we say let's go let's find the technology that's at the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity too often i think we we spend time on technology that's still at the peak of inflated expectations and, and you you all know what a technology that's over overhyped, overemphasized, and then sits unused uh, in a fossil layer in the classroom and, and never gets used. So what we do is try to make sure that we we put the right technology in. So finally, what are we going to talk about tonight? Uh, these are the top 10 emerging technologies. And the ones that I have starred are what I want to spend time on tonight because they are in the slope and the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity. We'll talk about mobile, cloud computing, learning management systems, content ownership technology, um, social media, privacy and cybersecurity tools, huge, huge part of what we do now, artificial intelligence and learning analytics, augmented and virtual reality, maker tools, and, and Dr. Miller here has an expert on the maker, maker movement that hopefully um, we'll be able to get some of her work in on this as well, and then adaptive assistive technology. So let's run through these. And again, if you have questions, please just type them into the, the chat box. Starting with mobile technology, you know, we, especially in the last two years, the funding has enabled schools to, to go one-to-one. -one. And even if that's not the best idea for the districts to provide one-to-one, 
uh, we we are seeing almost every district have one to one, which means every student has access to a device. And the question is whether the school district should supply that device or ask the students to get that on their own. And that's a, always a big subject of controversy and questions. But really, mobile learning is is here to stay. And if you really just look around, we're doing that already. And the COVID-19 has forced us to to go remote, as you all know. And we've learned a lot during these last two years of being forced to go remote and being forced to give to get everyone um, a device. And simultaneously, we're so, we're starting to see much better cellular service, cellular data service with 5G. And there's a lot of programs available to get to get that out there. Um, the impact that we're seeing is that the mobile technology has created a bring your own device, BYOD, one to one, flip learning, mobile learning, blended learning, and blended learning is probably the the strategy that'll most likely stick around after everyone's back. Uh, we're seeing lots of traction on blended learning, personalized learning, and, and other initiatives. But again, the tip there is you got to have a good infrastructure. This is an important slide that we've just added just the past few months of all the funding available in the United States and in Texas to fund the connected learner. So there's the Federal Emergency Connectivity Fund, the ECF fund. This year it was $7.17 billion for, for schools in the United States to buy um, mobile technology for their students and staff. And so they've just finished round three of that and they still haven't spent that. So there's still some money left in that in that fund. If you uh, do a search on emergency connectivity fund, you can see how to apply for that. And that's for home connectivity, mobile devices and Internet. The, there's also the federal E-rate fund that's been around a long time and that's four point three billion dollars this year and that funds Internet service and network electronics for schools. And so we take advantage of that. You're funded based on your um, free and reduced lunch status. And so that's a that's a great way to upgrade your infrastructure is the federal E-rate fund. There's also the Texas Instructional Materials and Technology Allotment. That funding is based on the number of students that you have in your district. There's the Texas Operation Connectivity that this year was $200 million just for the state of Texas to to fund mobile devices and connectivity. And then there's the Texas Broadband Development Fund and that um, the Texas, I'm sorry, the Texas Governor Broadband and that's just been formed. So it's we're un, it's unsure how much money or how we'll access that, but we'll be we will be watching closely. The next emerging technology is cloud computing and the cloud is a metaphor for the Internet. And I don't know if you know this, but in the early days of the Internet, when we were talking about the Internet, we would draw a picture of a cloud for uh, for data going into the clouds and coming back out of the clouds and that's stuck. And cloud computing really means that the application is hosted on a computer on the out on the Internet instead of locally. And that has driven a lot of as a service models. So software as a service, storage as a service and for right for for better or worse, we're seeing a lot of of emerging education as a service, whether that's tutoring as a service or teaching as a service. So we're, we're interested to to watch that as a service model in the K-12 as well. The next one is the learning management system. If you don't have a learning management system in your in your district or your university, then um, it's really hard to to do any kind of online or blended learning. And even if you don't have students online, it's critical to have a, an LMS in your in your district. And it's really the LMS is just a software application to deliver content, but also it does a lot of administration. It documents, it, it tracks, it allows students to turn in their their work online, and it's really the backbone of a modern learning environment. And we're seeing that the K-12s, most K-12s are implementing learning management systems. And again, COVID has has um, made that faster, has catalyzed that. And so you'll see a lot of that going on as well. The The current LMSs are are good. They're, they're not great. And so there's a lot of work being done on making them more 
user friendly, making them more social, making them more like a social media type platform only uh, within the district or within the university. The next one is content management. I'm sure you've been hearing about this blockchain technology and non fungible tokens, which means it's just a digital asset out there that you can buy and you can own. And this is really changing the ownership rights of content, whether that's textbooks or um, you've probably read about st certain stars buying, uh, offering non fungible tokens out in the metaverse. The, the other thing that's important that's been around a long time is open educational resources, which is free content for you to put into your learning management system. And if you go to oercommons.org, you'll see that there's a lot of free content. And there's even universities in Texas, uh, Rice University for one, that's offering free textbooks for a lot of uh, critical, critical subjects. And that's, that's emerging and it's changing the nature of the textbook market. And so we wanna make sure that we take advantage of that as well. The next emerging technology is social media. I, I don't have to remind this crowd about the impact of social media, the good and the bad of social media in the schools. We're still fumbling, trying to figure out the best way to, to leverage that for positive use and, and minimize and mitigate the risk. And so that's a big deal. So we're, we spend a lot of time working with with schools on um, various ways to handle social media. And by that, Facebook, which is now called Meta, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn, and the future Web 3.0, which is the true metaverse, will be coming. And it's actually uh, when it does come will be will be good for schools. And we can talk about that later if you'd like. And the next emerging technology is privacy and cybersecurity tools. We spend a tremendous amount of time. So if you've ever been hacked or if you're the the ransomware concept where the, the bad guys lock down your computer, lock down your computer systems and they demand ransom. This is happening to schools all over the state and all over the nation. And schools are a good are a major target simply because they have lack cybersecurity in their in their systems. So we, we spend a lot of time and I'd like to spend a little more time tonight just talking about some of these tools to keep you safe. There's education and awareness programs in Texas. You, you have to every staff member has to take a cybersecurity training. Every student has to take Internet safety training. There's a lot of vulnerability management software that's emerging that is really powerful to monitor those things. There's breach detection and breach prediction. So a lot of the artificial intelligence tools, the AI tools can actually predict breaches in your systems and in your personal um, systems. So that's that's powerful emerging technology. For schools, the, the concept of mobile device management MDM tools are important, especially as students are at home, teachers are at home. We have to manage and keep those mobile devices updated with the tools. And so that's something that schools don't do a great job with, and we need to focus more on managing those mobile devices that are out there. Uh, cybersecurity strategies, cybersecurity program establishment. It's actually the law in Texas under Senate Bill 820. And we have to, the required Children's Internet Protection Act. So these are policy issues that you have to implement. Not only are they are they the law, they're really a good idea and they're really powerful tools, the training, and it, it talks about proper storage and access, proper disposal of technology. If you've ever uh, destroyed your technology or just given it away, you know, people can actually get the get your information back from a from a even if you've deleted everything, it's there. What we're seeing is that the problem with this, it's a new line item for K-12 schools. And so schools tend not to fund this as much as they should, simply because it's it's new and some don't think it's a problem, but trust me, it's a huge problem. Probably well over 50% of schools have been hit by ransomware in the state of Texas so far. Um, we use something called a cybersecurity hygiene score which is really kind of like a credit score that you might get. And so the tools 
say give a score to everyone um, gives a score like for example impossible travel a good example of this is just yesterday we had a, a school administrator who was logged in from from their hometown as well as from russia at the same time and so that's impossible travel and we see that a lot so their 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 credibility their credentials have been stolen and they're being they're being uh, monitored so it's really a good idea to to monitor these things and make sure that you have the tools in place a lot of anonymous actors coming in through vpn tor browsers and again these are policy issues for schools to block these things we watch failed logins we watch operating system upgrades we watch security incident and event management logs and again these are predictive tools that tell us what's going on we look at virus malware logs and we combine this with regular meetings and um, conversations because again schools are not doing this and schools need to do this uh, this is an example of a dashboard i don't i've, I've blurred out all the names and information but uh, every every user gets a score. The top user has a score of 38, which is bad. So anything over score of 20 um, pops up to our attention so that we can see what's going on. The next emerging technology is AI and learning analytics. And you know th these are things that the social media, the Googles and the Facebooks have been doing for, for years, as well as trying to understand what you do and uh, schools aren't doing a good job of this at this point, but learning analytics uh, is, is, is the, the research that we do. And again, predictive analytics to see um, it's a type of learning analytics that can predict future outcomes in learning. The next emerging technology, augmented and virtual reality. And these are, these are tools that have been around a long time. They're slowly making their way into the K-12 classroom but these are, you can really integrate these things. And I know Dr. Miller here has done a lot of integrating of these tools into the normal classroom. And it has tremendous potential to add a lot of, of engagement to, to your school. Maker tools, it's amazing the 3D printers and the maker technology. So the maker tools that we we see or we we recommend putting in um, everything from web design to 3D printing, the robotics, the robotics are a, a wonderful way again to engage and teach math skills and problem solving skills, and even podcasting. Podcasting is has such a resurgence now, and it's really powerful to let the students do podcasting. Um, and this is one of our last emerging technologies, but it's certainly not the least. This is adaptive assistive technology is used to increase uh, the functional capabilities of, of everyone. So of, of special needs students or faculty, but but all of us, I, I find myself making my text a little bigger and making the background different. And so if you're if you're spending money on your technology, you really should start here. You get the most bang for the buck by implementing adaptive assistive technology to level the playing field for for all all learners so that was a quick run through of the 10. Um, what do we see as the the future of school that's being catalyzed by this and again it's it's a dangerous thing to predict it's a very dangerous thing to to talk about and predict but uh, what we're seeing right now and what we predict we'll see more of is the blended hybrid which means students are are coming to class with the certified teacher in the classroom, but they're also doing a lot of work online and in flexible scheduling and grouping and flexible pods. And we're seeing a lot of that. Just there's some real innovative, innovative um, activity going on in that area. Technology will also catalyze equity of access. We're seeing the fact that um, no matter where you are, uh, you can get access to this content. And that's the beautiful thing of about telecommunications. And again, if you if you're in a remote area or in an area that it's really powerful to be able to bring that telecommunications to the home as well. As I mentioned, we're seeing new funding and ownership models for content. We're seeing new funding mechanisms for schools themselves. We're seeing competitions for students between the online and the blended and the traditional and 
um, for better or worse, we're seeing a lot more online testing going on. We're hoping that the the AI, the predictive analytics work will have will force less and less one shot tests, one shot tests, and more um, testing throughout, depending on what you do on the computer. We're seeing a tremendous amount of cyber th security threats. So if you get nothing else out of tonight, I think if if you can remember the the concept of cybersecurity and safe computing. Um, I hope you you take that home. And we're seeing new technology staffing models, and that's uh, also as we do a lot of our uh, provide fractional chief technology officer services. We're seeing new models to support both technology at home and as and in the university. So, how do you know if your technology program is good? This this slide actually came from one of our clients who as a superintendent of a K-12 who asked me, you know, how is our technology program? And, and how do you know? What's the yardstick? What's the meter stick that you use to measure? All you can say is, well, you might be, you know, we're, we're in the top 1,200 in the state of Texas or something, but there are only 1,200 school districts in the state of Texas. So we've, de we've developed a couple strategies to evaluate your technology program and your integration. And we talk about key performance indicators. We talk about surveys and observations. It's interesting that with all the money spent on technology, there, there's really very little accountability that we're seeing. And so I, I think we'll see eventually see a backlash against all the spending on technology without putting in some type of accountability measures that, that technology is, is not only positively impacting teaching and learning, but that it, it's, 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 it's ubiquitous and it's it's good for for learning. We look at the following um, key key performance indicators, uh, KPIs. We look at uptime. We look at activity. So we have tools that monitor the activity. You know, what are the students doing with the technology? What which um, which learning applications are they using? Again, we talk about the cybersecurity hygiene. We look at trouble ticket analysis because when you add all this technology, if you don't add a lot of technology support, then you will fail. It takes a tremendous amount of support to support even the one-to-one -one programs. We look at customer feedback, and then we also have some observation protocols uh, walking through the schools and seeing what's going on. Probably the, the most important thing you can do is what we call the digital review process. And that's a really it's a it's a strategy to vet all new technology, all the emerging technology and uh, through the lens of your district goals, because all districts are unique. And so all the emerging technologies that we talk about, um, you really have to vet those and have a conversation with everyone on the curriculum side, on the technology side, on the on the student side to see is this the best technology? And then also this evaluates the total cost of ownership, which schools tend not to do, um, which is the initial and ongoing cost, training and support. And then of course, never forget the teacher and the learner. We have a we have a technology planning and certification cohort. The next one starts in June of this year. If you're interested, um, you can contact us. And if you want more information on the Renaissance Institute, I'll leave that up and April, I just gave you, I just gave just everyone, gave everyone an entire semester in 30 minutes of, of class time. So I hope I didn't go so too fast and I, I can't see if there are questions or not. OK, we do have some questions and right, right. I imagine once you start answering the questions, we'll generate some more. So the very first question is from uh, Jesse Kelch and she's a professor in the geology department. Jesse wants to know, does device exclusively mean tablet or does it usually mean tablet? When, I, when we say device, we mean, you know, it could be anything from a from a tablet to an iPod to an iPad, um, a laptop. So we use all devices, let, let's say interchangeably with mobile device. Any mobile device that's on the Internet is is what we call device. Did I answer that well? I don't see a follow up, but if she has more questions, I'll okay, let you know. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Scott Polk um, and Scott asks, will we see or are we seeing AI being used in cyber attacks? Great question. 
the answer is yes, yes, and yes. It's 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 a the attacks are becoming very sophisticated. Um, last month we saw we once we when we put our tools on a district site, we found that people had been lurking in the network for over six months, just monitoring and learning and putting the the activities of the district through AI tools so that they know when to hit. And it, it truly, they know when people are on vacation, when spring break and winter break and Christmas break. So the answer is yes, there's a tremendous amount of um, sophistication in the attacks right now. And it's very much a cat and mouse game of, of trying to stop them and trying to stay ahead of them. But there's a lot of really good tools out there that um, are also AI based that can predict what's going on. So again, cat and mouse game, but great question. OK, thanks. Um, next question is from from uh, Angela McGuire. So Angie asks, while the focus brings attention to more engaging tech tools for learning, how are educators to learn without the resources in place and keep up with all the trends? That you know, that is that is the age old question of how do you train? And I, I'm going to assume Angie, that you were talking about teachers. But, but we, we also we also think we also know that you have to train students. We tend to think students are, you know, can automatically learn and they know how to do lots on technology. They don't necessarily know how to use them in a school situation or to learn. So to answer the question, we have a, a strategy called the Beyond Hardware strategy that we've used, and that is that it's done at the K-12 level. It's done campus by campus at the university level. It can be done by department, but that the, the technology is there and the training is done situated where the teachers are. So on their campus or in their department on the exact technology that they're going to use. And the training itself is based on a problem or a, you know something that the school is trying to do. For example, the last one was trying to raise attendance or or trying to increase math scores. So we bring in the curriculum people because that's critical as well because it's not about the technology. And we found that that gives a lot more meaning to the training and it's it's easier. And if you train in a cohort, if you train an entire campus at a time or an entire department at a time, it, it really forms a powerful cohort to learn together. If the, the wrong way to do it is probably is to bring people into a, a strange environment and, and just show them how to do things and then send them back to the classroom that it, it's not that's not that doesn't work. I wish it did. It just it does not work. So you have to train situated where they are and that takes time that takes uh, funding and and then you can't it can't just be a one time. You have to spiral back. Uh, we go back in a month and see how we're we doing. What did we not teach well? What questions do you have? But I think the powerful part of that program is you, you train a lot of teachers together, and so they're a tremendous support. And um, and it's the same with students. But that that's, that, a, great that's a great question. Thanks. All right, here's another one. Um, Francisco Sanchez asks, when will we see educational philosophies match the technologies we're adopting? Better yet, when and how can we test divergent intelligence or multiple intelligences rather than the same centralized test? Wow, um, that's a deep question. Um, I I think it's going to be a while before we do away with the one centralized test. We are seeing a lot of work in the in the predictive analytics and the monitoring of being able to see how students are doing. And again, the Facebook, you know, the social media giants have been doing this for years. They know more about you than 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 you know about yourself. And so I, I think that will be I think it's going to be a long time. I found that we tend to overestimate the short term impact of technology and underestimate the, the long term. So for example, the Internet when it was first hyped and hit the <clears throat> the peak in the hype cycle, we thought it was going to change everything. And then everyone was disappointed in the educational world that it didn't fix things. And then 
years later, we're starting to see that it is having an impact. And the first part of your question, I think I heard was about when will the philosophies match? I think the better question to ask is how do we how do we use technology to catalyze good learning and good teaching? Because our teachers know how to teach and and there's good teaching going on. We just have to find a way to blend to, to blend the technology to to support that, to augment that. That's the strategy I would use. Otherwise, I don't think I don't think teachers will change to to fit the technology. I think we have to fit the technology to change to impact the teacher. Thank you. OK, we have one more. And if you all have questions, please enter them into the chat. We've, we've still got a little bit of time. Um, our next question is from Maddie Bob. Um, and Maddie asks, has the Renaissance Institute seen K-12s and higher education institutes start to use their own internal social media platforms? If so, wouldn't this be another threat to cybersecurity? You know, it, it, it is. And so the, the big the big question is how much social media, I mean, how much social learning, let me start over. We, we know that people learn in social environments. We learn best socially. You know, and the, the education theory back to Vygotsky is, is proves this, that we learn best on social. Now, the question is, do we use what we think of traditionally as social media, like just everyone on Facebook learning? No, no, it, it has because Facebook and and, you know, the other socials are not necessarily about learning. They're more about targeted advertising. And so to bring that in under the control of of the institution is the next big step that we we have to find a way to make these learning management systems more social and and more able for students to interact with each other even if they're not in the same place and especially now as students are separated we have to find a safe controlled way to to bring social media into this we haven't found that yet it's either completely you know out in the web out in the wild or it's it's so boring in some of these learning management systems that the chat boards and things that are not really effective so we we've, we've got to find a way there are a lot of there is a lot of funding going into social learning platforms i've yet to see one that's really powerful but i, I think within the next three years we'll see some powerful social uh, learning management systems uh, emerge. And, I, and Maddie Bob, I, I hope I've answered your question. OK, um, waiting for more questions to come in. Actually, Brenda Quintanilla just um, texted or chatted a question, however you say that. Brenda wants to know, what's your outlook on integrating immersive worlds into the learning process? Yeah, so again, that's a that's a I think we're we're probably overestimating that right now, overestimating the short term of the metaverse because there's so much hype. It's the metaverse is really on the peak of inflation right now, expectations. But I guarantee you that it will happen, and some some school district, maybe Alpine or Sol Ross uh, University, will will find a way. But I think it's going to be a while before we find a way to to bring that in. It's important to do that because there's so many things that can be accomplished in the metaverse. And if if you're not familiar with with the metaverse, it's really it's it's the next version of the web, web 3.3.0. Web 1.0 was just kind of a static web page. You know, hey, I have a web page. Uh, web 2.0 was interacting and web 3.0 is moving into um, immersive worlds, as the questioner just mentioned, and being able to be in a, a cyber class or a cyber business meeting. And uh, there's very little research going on on the effectiveness of that right now. I think, again, we'll have some false starts like we did with all technology, trying to implement that. But I think long term, and we're probably five to seven years before I think we see that as an effective tool for for learning. But again, I, I could be wrong. You know, that, that's the problem with predicting. Uh, we're, we're wrong a lot. It may happen faster. I don't think so. I think it's at the peak of inflation, inflated ideas right now. 
and um, it'll go into the trough of disillusionment. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back to that, uh, if you don't mind, go back to that slide because we really do refer to this slide a lot. So I think if you look at some of these things we talked about, they're in the plateau of productivity. The metaverse is probably still in the peak of inflated expectations and will disappoint us for a while and then we'll become productive. I'd like to I'd like know, what, know what our what our audience thinks about that. You know, what is their opinion? What would would you teach or would you learn in that situation? Let's see what they say. A um, couple more. I entered a question and those of you that know me know why I'm going to ask this one, but um, this is all a lot or maybe some would say it's a lot for teachers to manage on top of curriculum and testing and classroom management and all those things former teacher. Um, how can we rely on others in the educational sphere to assist and help us drive technology? Like how can we work with instructional designers or librarians and others? Yeah, that, that's a great question, April. I think I think it goes back to to what we talked about at first. It, the, the, tech, the technology has to adapt itself to to our our learning, to our to our teaching. And the best way to do that is the universities have to lead this charge. The universities have to lead this charge of, of finding the best technology to teach this, the best technology to teach that, how to integrate technology into this. And then the, the K-12 teachers have to have some, some time off, honestly, to learn and to experiment. I think there's plenty of good ideas at every K-12 school that I work with to do this. It's just that there's not enough time. And so the ones that are successful find ways to give teachers an, another block off or some something during the day and very focused teaching like like I mentioned that's in their schools and on something that's that's not a separate curriculum. I think if we try to integrate technology as a separate curriculum we will fail and we're seeing a lot of failures in that aspect. We have to wrap this around what teachers do so well already, which is work, which is the human, the human aspect of teaching. OK, we had a couple technology questions. Um, Dominic Prococo asks um, or says our implementation of virtual reality VR AR has been halted by the lack of available content. How do you get around this hold up without creating your own? I think there'll be plenty of content that that comes forward over the next few years, um, and teachers are going to have to figure out if it fits into their, you know, their scope and sequence or into their their teaching style. I don't think content's going to be a problem over the short term. I really don't. Just like as if you follow the money, the money is is being sent into these kinds of virtual reality and gaming online, you know, gaming and I think that there'll be plenty of content, but whether it's it's good for the K-12 and university for teaching is you're going to have to adapt it. There's no money that we can see in the venture capital or people. There's no money being spent on content for K-12 science in the metaverse. We're, at least we're not seeing it. And there's no money being spent on the, on virtual reality experiences in math. And if there is, we're not aware of it and it's it's very little. It's just not getting funded. Hopefully, and then maybe it'll be the, the textbook companies, you know, which you which have completely gone online already. Um, I don't think it will be. I think they'll there'll be some third party that that comes out now that they once they develop the content, they will be able to own it. Uh, with blockchain technology, it'll be easier to prove that they own it. And I, I think that'll that'll catalyze a lot of content generation. And that's my opinion. It's yet to be seen. These are great questions. There's some good chat going on. Um, Brenda Quintanilla followed up and said she's pilot, piloting immersive tools like Frame VR 
and Wanda spaces, which are actually or which actually have an integration piece into Canvas. Um, courses like fashion are using immersive stores as a way to create online commerce. These tools can be accessed through VR, but also on a computer. And then um, Brenda also recommended Oculus as a free education VR simulation. This is good information. Thank you for that. And Angie McGuire worries um, about the time for training and staff support because by the time a tool is engaged and assessed and actually picked up for use, um, a new trend will be here. I, I mean that that has been the way it is if the training's not done well, and you know there's an art to training, and I think that charge has to be led by the university. Uh, of finding good ways to train because the technology is changing, but it's not it's it's on it's the same type of technology. Now we're going to see lots more social technology, uh, faster Internet, all those things, but the basics aren't going to change for a while. And so we have to find a better way to to give the teachers the time and and to give them the correct technology. That's what the digital review process is all about. Uh, too often, I think we we tend to just buy technology that's on the that's on the hype cycle, uh, without putting a lot of thought into it, and then we waste everyone's time and money training. But we're seeing some really really good things going on in the K twelve world as far as integration of technology, and it's all being a lot of it's being done just by these creative individual teachers that have found a way to do it. Now, if we could we can press that expertise around, that would be we'd have something. All right, we got another question. Um, this one comes from Jacob Fuentes, and Jacob is our new CIO here at Sol Ross. Um, Jacob asks for a significant amount of time. The purchase of cybersecurity insurance has been largely adopted as an industry standard practice, not only in higher ed, but in the private, private sector. Lately, I've participated in discussions where institutions are considering no longer purchasing cyber insurance due to how expensive it's become and how fewer insurance providers are remaining in the market. Have you noticed this trend? Will cyber insurance costs outweigh the benefits of maintaining that coverage? Well, obviously, Jacob, you're, you're in the business, so you're seeing it as well. We're seeing this a lot. So in the early days, you know, five years ago or so, it was pretty easy for schools to buy cyber security insurance. Um, unfortunately, there have been so many ransomware attacks that people have been accessing that that insurance and paying people off. What we're seeing over just over the last year is that you can still get cyber security insurance, but now there's a bar that says, do you have, for example, the questions we're being asked now are, do you have multi-factor authentication on, on all your elevated accounts. Um, do you have, you know, there's, so there's a lot of questions that raise the bar that if you answer yes, then yes, you can still get insurance at a, at a, at a decent rate. But, um, and I think that bar will continue to be higher and higher, the questions that they're, they ask, because it's especially the, the elevated accounts like Jacob probably has of, you know, do we have multi-factor authentication on those? Uh, password protection and and do we have backups that are are um, air gapped so that because even the backups get corrupted in many of these ransomware attacks so do we have immutable backups so these are all the questions that the insurance companies are becoming very savvy about and asking and um, I'd be more than happy to talk more about that if you want great thank you all right I I think unless one somebody has one last question, we may be. Wait for just a second. OK, I think we are right about at the end of this. Um, so thank you, Dr. Burning, and thank everybody for attending today. Um, I think we all learned a ton and this was a great discussion. So like I said before, everyone here will get a link to the recording of this lecture. Um, hopefully in a couple of days, it might be a week. Sometimes these things take a minute. Um, and so let's see, while we're here, I guess I'll take this opportunity to say that um, we have another lecture that y'all might be interested in. Um, it's happening on Friday. Dr. Lewis Harvison, Director of Borderland Research Institute, 
we'll be discussing um, the last frontier. So that's something everyone can register for on the calendar. I can send a link to that. You might be interested too, Dr. Birding, in that one. Um, yeah, yeah. It's always interesting hearing what's going on out here with the wildlife and the wildlife management. So um, with that, all these little beeps that you're hearing are just saying thank you, um, you great presentation. Um, I think a few people may follow up with you even after this, which is great. So thanks again so much. Um, I enjoyed this. I hope everybody else did. Um, and with that, I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. And again on a lecture. Thank you so much.